scared to death. My name is Sandman and I'm your host. Just in case you've never heard of scared to death and you don't know what this is, then let me tell you. This podcast replays the best of old time horror, science fiction, and mystery radio plays. You can catch new episodes on the fourth Friday of every month at eight o'clock p.m. Central Time. Well, if you've listened earlier tonight, you'll know that I've been presenting a special double feature episode in celebration for Halloween. You just heard the first episode, the original Mercury Theater presentation of Dracula, and now it's time for the second radio play in my Halloween double feature, Frankenstein. It's proven to be extremely difficult to find any information about this radio play, except for that it takes a lot of liberties with the original story, and that it was presented by the Weird Circle. The Weird Circle was a 30-minute mystery horror radio series that aired on NBC for four years from 1943 to 1947. It featured stories derived from classic horror, ghost tales, and supernatural stories written by popular authors such as Honore de Blazek, Charles Dickens, Emily Bronte, Robert Louis Stevenson, Edgar Allan Poe, and many more. Each story was presented in the format of introducing the narrator first and then proceeding to the plot. What sets the Weird Circle apart from other programs airing horror and ghost stories or other similar sci-fi stories is that it focused so heavily on the works of classic, highly revered authors. Many of the stories are intended to relate to people's fears of the unknown, of a past coming back to haunt someone, or of misdeeds being repaid in unexpected ways. These stories are about dark parts of our psyches brought to life in the form of ghosts and other objects mysteriously brought to life. This is a collection that is not to be missed. Since the show is not as well known or well remembered as many of its counterparts, it is of high quality though, and no small part due to the greatness of the works on which it bases the episodes. Although mystery and horror series were popular during the time the show aired, Weird Circle just didn't actually gain as much attention as its contemporaries due to a lot of factors. It was regarded, though, as just your average horror series. This radio play originally aired on Sunday, February 20th, 1944, I present to you the original 1944 version of Frankenstein. The Weird Circle. In this cave where the restless sea, we are met to call from out of the past stories, strange and weird. Bellkeeper, toll the bell so that all may know we are gathered again in the Weird Circle.
of the past. Phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale, Frankenstein. The wind howling outside my lonely home is my only companion. All else is quiet here as I sit by my window in the parlor writing this document for the scientific world. Be warned, you doctors and scientists who come after me. Be warned that man must not experiment with the secrets of life. My experiences started in the University of Manchester where I was studying natural history. It was after class, May 22nd, 1818, that Professor Waldman, my close dear friend Henry Clerval, and myself were in the laboratory of the university. Victor Frankenstein, your persistence amazes me. Someday I shall sit at your feet and allow you to teach me. Thank you, Professor Waldman. But the whole subject of the structure of man has always been too clouded in mysticism. Well, frankly, Victor, I prefer mysticism. Well, that's because you're a mystic, Henry. Why, Henry's no more a mystic than I am. He just loves to avoid arduous work. Oh, translating that means I'm lazy, eh, Professor? Well, if you prefer to put it that way, I rather think of you as a student whose nervous structure does not take kindly to natural history. <laughs> the professor's kinder to you than you are to yourself, Henry. Well, if I worked as hard as you do, Victor, I should probably wear that same gaunt, sleepless look that you carry about. Well, my experiment will be finished tonight. And then I'll manage the eight hours sleep that other men manage. The secret experiment will be finished tonight, huh? Well, then, will you tell us just exactly what you're doing in the basement at home? I'll tell the entire world. As a matter of fact, I, I stayed after class this afternoon, Professor Waldman, to ask you to join me this evening in the basement of our place to watch the completion of my work. Oh. Well, how about me? I don't think I dare invite more than one, Henry. And the professor is more interested in this type of procedure than, than you are. I shall be delighted, Victor. Just the best friend who never knows what's going on in his own home, that's all. It's not that, Henry. But I thought you'd entertain Elizabeth for me, while the professor and I were at work. Entertaining Elizabeth would be a delightful favor, old boy. You know, I think you trust me too much with her. Have you ever met Victor's fiance, Professor Waldman? She's one of the most charming... Yes, Elizabeth was one of the most charming, beautiful women I'd ever known. I had been in love with her from childhood, but even my love for Elizabeth couldn't dim my passionate zeal for the work I was doing. It was eight o'clock that evening. Henry, Elizabeth, and I were seated in the parlor. Elizabeth was saying... I'll be so glad, Victor, darling, when all this is over. If you only knew how tired you look. The minute my work is done, successfully or unsuccessfully, I promise you, Elizabeth, we'll be married and, and off to Switzerland before Henry has time to lock up this place. But first, we find out about the secret in the basement. Henry's being eaten up by curiosity. I don't blame him. I'm suffering pangs of what's it all about, too. Well, you'll both know soon. I wonder where Professor Wallman is. He's late. He'll be here soon, Victor. Stop pacing the floor, sweetheart. I think I'll start my work downstairs. Send the professor down when he arrives, will you, darling? We'll come down ourselves and take a look around. Or will I turn into a pillar of salt for peeking? Nobody ever turned into a pillar of salt for peeking, Beth. It was for looking back. Oh, nothing like a good practical working knowledge of the Bible for scientific experiments. <laughs> Starts the night off right. Yes, I thought jokingly of that paragraph from the Bible then. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. But what about a man who looks back? There is no ready reference for him or for me. I went downstairs to my laboratory at a little past eight, opened the door, and started to tinker around to pass the time more quickly. My every sense was alive, taut, waiting, with the sense of what was to come. I heard a knock on the side door, which led me from my laboratory directly into the forest, which bordered Manchester. I looked out and... Good evening, Victor. Oh, did Elizabeth tell you to come down this way, Professor? No, I found the entrance to your laboratory quite by myself. Can I help you with your coat, sir? No, 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 you proceed with your work. Nothing like trivialities to annoy a scientist at work. <clears throat> there we are. Well, follow me, Professor, into the back room, and you'll see for yourself what this is all about. Well, I feel that I'm in for a most exhilarating evening. I wish I had more students fashioned in your mold, Victor. 
Well, Professor, here is my... Why, what's this? A full-sized replica of a man. Yes, only he isn't full-sized. He's fashioned on a grander scale. I should say this creature standing up would be approximately eight feet, two inches tall. Well, you should have been an artist, Victor. He's a perfect reproduction. What did you make him out of? Wood? Clay? Animal flesh. Flesh? Feel him. Oh, feels like the body of a dead man. Or the body of a man who hasn't as yet been brought to life. This body is complete in every detail. Heart, lungs, teeth. Even the fine nervous system. Oh, it's interesting. Yes, interesting. How about the brain cells? Yes, adult brain cells. I think he's quite handsome, don't you? Well, each man to his own taste. He's the best reproduction of a man I've ever seen, but actually his face is hideous. As a plastic surgeon, my dear Victor, I'm afraid I can't give you much credit. Well, what do you intend to do with this hulk? Do you see this fluid here in the test tube? Yes. I fill the hypodermic needle with it. And now, now I'm going to inject the full eight ounces into the vein, directly above his heart. But why? Watch. You see, Professor, quite by accident, I stumbled on the secret of life. I've been bringing small, one-celled creatures to life for quite some time. The secret of life? Within 30 seconds, after this injection, this creature will live. You're trying to play God, Victor. It's heresy. It's science. I'm making a new race, by far finer than the present one. Larger in structure, stronger, heavier, healthier. A race able to live on nuts and berries. With a greater capacity for feeling. Victor, for the love of heaven, don't go through with this experiment. No man living has the right to tamper with the secret of life. You've created a monster on that floor. You've no idea what will happen if you go through with this. Watch, Professor. The injection. I only hope and pray this is a failure. It can't be. His eyes moved. Watch him, Professor. He's like a baby, first realizing life. His hands touch the floor. His eyes are trying to focus on the world around him. He's hideous. Yes, he's hideous. I made the skin too much like parchment, I'm afraid. Victor, get rid of that monster. Uh, he's trying uh, to stand up. Uh, if that mind which you've created is a twisted one, have you any idea what kind of horror you've let loose in England? As a humanitarian, I feel it my Christian duty to do this uh, now. Put that knife down, Professor. No, uh, I can't let... Ooh! Uh, Oh, he's got me in the clutch of his hand. Uh, Command him to stop this, Victor. Uh, stop fighting him, uh, Professor. He's frightened. Uh, he has the same reactions uh, as a child. Uh, grabs and won't let uh, loose. Let me go, monster. Uh, oh. Stop. Don't go out that door. Uh, Put the professor down. Don't go out that door. Uh, the monster left my laboratory through the side entrance into the forest carrying the incredibly mangled body of the professor with him. I rushed out of my laboratory after him, but the creature was faster than I, and he disappeared from view. I returned to my laboratory and destroyed all evidence of the creature's manufacture. I burned the blueprints from which I had made his body. Then, carefully, I locked my laboratory and went upstairs to join Henry Clerval and Elizabeth. I must have looked wild-eyed as I entered the room. Henry, that's most amusing. You tell the best anecdotes in all of England. Oh, you flatter me, Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, Victor, you're through sooner than we expected. Uh, Darling, what's the matter? Didn't the professor show up? Nothing's the matter. My experiment was... was a failure. Oh. But the professor... He never showed up. Beth, Henry, I, I want to go away. Of course, darling, we will, as soon as Henry can get the house locked up. Uh, I don't want to wait. I want to leave at once, tonight, please, tonight, Beth. We can get married before we cross the channel and, and then go to Switzerland. But it's almost midnight now, darling. What's the difference? Please, Beth, if you love me. But why tonight, Victor? Henry, you've no idea what I've been through. I have to get away at once. Of course, darling, if you insist. Anything you want. And we'll be married before daylight. Darling, darling, Beth. I know a little minister whom we can awake. And so Beth and I were married that evening in a little chapel on the coast. 
Then the three of us fled to Bern, Switzerland. I refused to have anything to do with the civilized world. No newspapers, no word of home. Just the peace and quiet of the Swiss mountains. Henry and Elizabeth both tried to learn of the events which had occurred in my laboratory that evening. But I never broke my silence on that subject. After the first tries, they refrained from asking me about it again. It was in the middle of the fourth month of our visit when Henry and I were sitting on the terrace of the little house in the mountain. Beth was out picking berries when Henry suddenly... Victor, I'm your closest friend. I've tried to keep silent about... Well, Victor, the day after we left England, I bought a newspaper. Did you, Henry? Yes, I saw this clipping on the front page. I couldn't very well miss it. Well, what clipping? This one. The horribly mangled remains of Professor Waldman was found on Beekman Hill. The identity of the unknown murderer is being sought by Scotland Yard. Poor Professor Waldman. I, I had no idea. Hadn't you? No. What are you trying to say to me, Henry? You're leaving England so suddenly that very night. Your fear of being discovered, the secret experiment. Well, it, it all seemed to add up to some, some kind of strange connection with this clipping. Now, if you're in trouble, Victor, you can depend on me. I'll stay by your side. I'm not in trouble. I'm just tired, terribly tired. And you know nothing of the professor? Absolutely nothing. He didn't come to our chateau that evening. I told you he didn't then. Stop questioning me. Victor! Victor! We're out here, Beth. Oh, I've just had a horrible experience. Oh, darling, I'm, I'm so glad to see you, honey. pale, Beth. Sit down right here next to me. Well, what happened, Beth? Well, I was, I was walking in the woods not far from here when I looked up and saw... Well, I saw a man, sort of a man standing over me. Well, men aren't so bad. That is, if you happen to know the right ones, and you do. I, I'm not joshing, Henry. He wasn't exactly a man. He, he was twice the height of anyone I've ever seen. And his skin looked like dried parchment. It's... it's incredible, but... I think I've seen a monster. A monster? Yes, I... I ran away. He didn't follow me. He just... just stared after me, watching me. You do believe me, don't you? A monster stared after oh, look, you? look, look! Henry, Victor, through the trees right out there. Look! There he is again! Yes, the monster stood there, silhouetted against the trees. The monster which I had created, standing like an evil glut of flesh and blown, moved in the darkening twilight. And then suddenly, phantom-like, it disappeared. Beth and Henry both watched me as I started from the piazza after the disappearing creature in the backwoods. As I drew near to the heavily wooded section, Giant footprints in the soft mud about me showed the path ahead. The sun was sinking in the west, and the last orange pinpoints of light needled my flesh until every sense within me was tingling with the expectations of seeing my living horror. Then I realized I was unarmed. Every crooked tree, each twisted branch which obstructed my path, appeared to be his form. I heard the crackling of a branch and the moving of a form on the velvet moss. I thought you'd come, Creator. You. Are you frightened, Creator? You dare talk to me. Please, don't turn away from me. Please. Let me go. I mean no harm to you. Listen to me, Victor Frankenstein. You must listen to me. You created me. You owe me that much. I owe you nothing, murderer. Why am I a murderer? Because you created a form so horrible, a face so distorted that no man can look upon me and... Call me friend. 
I'm an outcast. You can save me. Let me go. Not until you hear my story. Sit down, creator. My arm. Let me go. I wandered through the streets of London that first day. Children screamed in the streets. People flocked together trying to kill me. And I was lonely and hungry. How did you follow me here? Not so long ago, I returned to my birthplace, the laboratory, broke in and discovered your identity. But first, I fled to Scotland and lived outside of a cottage. That's how I learned to speak. An old blind man was teaching a young French girl to speak English. I listened to the lessons from the open windows. Now, what do you expect of me? A companion, a woman of the same species with my defects, one who will be my friend. This, this being, you must create. No, I'll not do it. You must. Every man's entitled to a wife. No. You must. If you create her for me, I'll take her with me into the far wastes, and no one will ever see either of us again, ever. How will you live? On fruits and berries. We'll manage together. Please, you can't deny me this. A maid. A monster's maid. You will? You will? I swear, I'll never harm another human. Never, Creator, if you'll only grant me just one companion. And if I refuse? If you refuse, even a brain that you have made, Creator, might become twisted and distorted. And so that night in the forest, I made a devil's bargain. I bargained to create a monster's mate, perhaps another murderer. How could I know? The monster swore to live in the forest and wait, wait a year or two years if necessary. And upon completion of my work, he would take his companion away. But if I broke my promise, he swore revenge. And so I started work. I searched Paris for the necessary equipment, built a shack in the woods about a mile away from our chalet. Three months I worked, three solid months, shaping her who was to be his mate. And then one night, it was windy outside. I thought the wind had blown the door open when... Victor! Victor, I'm sorry, I had to disturb you. Is it Beth? No, not Beth. She's fine and sends her love. It's the townspeople. Your activities have stirred up a lot of curiosity. Oh, the fools! Well, I can't blame them, especially after the rumors which have been going around. Rumors of the... Victor, you know the monster in these forests. You've known of him all along. People have seen him and connect him with you. Mothers in the village are frightened of their children. I know nothing. Look, I'm only trying to help you. I know nothing, I tell you. But the men have banded together. They're going to make a raid on you here, to burn your laboratory down, and to find the monster who lives in these woods. They can't! They mustn't! Oh, what? devil's work are you carrying on, man? I'm trying to help you. Oh, Victor, will you please let your friends be your friends? Henry, go back to Beth and leave me alone. Beth is safe at home. You're in danger and I won't leave your side this night, my friend. Then be prepared. Prepared for what? You've guessed many of the reasons for my secrecy. Then there is a monster. At school, I stumbled on the secret of life. I was trying to create a superior race. I was a fool, and I created him instead. And he does live? Yes, he lives. Professor Waldman, what happened to Professor Waldman? The night I created the monster, Waldman became frightened. He screamed, attempted to kill the creature. The creature, like a child, warded him off and, and then tore him to pieces in front of me. I couldn't stop him. The monster had killed before it had really begun to live. 
Then what? The monster left the basement through the side entrance, carrying the professor's corpse. I had no choice. I had to leave the country. Oh, what are you doing with that creature now? Fulfilling a promise. Follow me into my cabin and I'll show you. How soon do you think the townsfolk will be here? Oh, within two hours or so. They're meeting in the square in town. Come in. What? A woman. Yes, a woman. The monster's mate, his friend. I promised him a friend. And in return, he swears to hide himself forever from the world. A, a devil's bargain, Victor. A bargain I must keep for all our sakes. But the monster proved himself a murderer time and time again. Why, in London, after the death of Professor Waldman. Time and time again. But how do you know that the mate won't be even more vicious than he? You'll let loose an avalanche of hatred. Or destroy her before you bring her to life. Yes, avalanche of hatred. Look, you've no time to waste. Set fire to this cabin quickly, Victor. Set fire to the cabin and come away. What man alive, you can't go through with this thing. But the promise. It's a promise to a fiend. He'll be your death and ours, Victor. Oh, hurry, man, hurry, if you've any love for Beth. I've been insane with grief and fear for Beth and you. Go back to Beth, Henry, at, at once and wait for me. And you? I, I'll set fire to the cabin as soon as I destroy my books. I, I'll join you later. Well, hurry, friend. We'll meet you home as soon as you can make it. For one full hour, I worked feverishly. I soaked the shack in oil, and then taking a taper from the vase, I, I lit the fire. The fire started quickly. I placed my books in the very center of the room and then opened the door of my shack. The experiment was at an end, and I felt free. The monster's mate would never live. I walked out, and then I saw him, his face contorted with rage. <laughs> I knew then what was in his mind as he raced through the forest in front of me. The blazing shack was a beacon of light, and I saw his huge, misshapen form outdistance me, far outdistance me. He was faster than I, taller than I, and covered more territory. Racing, running blindly through the forest, I reached my home. The door of my home was flung open. Henry, mutilated and torn, stumbled blindly toward me. Victor. <laughs> The monster. Henry, Henry, what? I, I tried to, Victor. I, Henry, you. Beth. Beth, hello. Uh, upstairs. Beth! Beth, I'm coming, darling, I'm coming. I'm coming upstairs. <laughs> I'm coming, darling, I'm coming. If you kill her, I'll... Beth! Beth. Beth, oh, my darling. My darling. Oh, Beth, no. No. Both you and Henry. Both dead. Uh, you two are alone, creator. Yes. Both of them were dead. All my dear ones gone from me now, and I'm alone. The wind howling outside my window is my only companion. All else is quiet as I sit by my window, writing this document. I am dying of loneliness and fear, shunned by the world, hated by everyone. I know I am waiting only for the monster's return. And he, having eluded the world, will return when I've suffered my full share of misery, as he has suffered his. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the story, Frankenstein. Bellkeeper, toll the bell.
from the time-worn pages of the past, we have heard another immortal tale in The Weird Circle. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Be here in this lonely cave by the restless sea once again next time for another immortal tale in The Weird Circle. Well, that's going to do it for this special double feature Halloween episode of Scared to Death. I certainly hope that you enjoyed tonight's presentation of Dracula and Frankenstein. You can find past episodes of Scared to Death as well as my companion podcast, Parareality, and set it off on my website, parareality.com. All you need to do is look in the archive section on the website. I hope that you have a wonderful Halloween weekend. Stay safe, but party hard. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back on November 26th with another episode of Scared to Death. And now, I'll leave you. I hope you haven't taken my stories too seriously. Presented by Parareality.